Hi, I'm Ira Wallace with Southern Exposure Seed Exchange here at Acorn Community Farm. And I'm for the soil because the soil is the basis of our agriculture. Soil grows our plants and I love good soil. Welcome, everyone, to For the Soil, a conversation. I'm your host, Jeff Ishi, and we've got a great guest for you today, Mr. Steve Groff. He is a farmer, an author, and a cover crop coach. You're going to enjoy this conversation with Steve Groff. Before we get to the podcast today, I would like to remind everyone of the blog page on our website, forthesoil.org. That's the digit for thesoil.org. And one of our most recent blog entries is about the pawpaw fruit. Yep, pawpaw. <laughs> P-A-W-P-A-W. If you've never heard of a pawpaw, it's a fascinating fruit, and it is in season from late summer to mid-fall. If you want to learn more about growing pawpaws, just see our blog entry at forthesoil.org. And while you're there, take the pledge to improve the soil in your own backyard and on your own farming operation. Now let's get to this episode with Mr. Steve Groff. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishi, and it is our pleasure to welcome a very special guest to the podcast today. Of course, uh, Mary Sketch Bryant with the Virginia Soil Health Coalition, Eric Benfelt with Virginia Cooperative Extension Community Viability, our co-hosting today. And, and Eric, I'd like for you to introduce our guest today. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's good. We're pleased to have Steve Groff with us of Cedar Meadow Farms up in the Lancaster County area and Steve has really been a proponent and advocate for soil quality and soil health. I know for myself, I met, first met Steve in the, I think 2002 when we had a soil quality tour and I was actually looking for some photos up on Mole Hill in West Rockingham County. And then uh, we also had the good fortune of taking a group of farmers up to Steve's annual field day back in 2006. So we're really pleased to have Steve and uh, welcome to the show, Steve. Hey, thanks a lot, Eric and, uh, and Mary and Jeff. It's just a honor to be able to, uh, you know, be a part of what you're doing in this whole concept of soil health. And if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your background in farming and then your journey with soil health. Sure. I am a third generation farmer and soil health expert. I've uh, literally traveled the world helping farmers and those who influence the farmers understand how to grow uh, food, whether it be for animals or for human consumption. And more recently, I'm trying to connect that with nutrient density and how that affects our, uh, our overall health and well-being. And I know that may seem a little forward thinking uh, for some, but uh, everything I've been doing over the past 40 years has kind of led me to this point. And I find it fascinating. Those in the, the movement will say, you know, pretty much started with no-till then we got into cover crops and then now we call it regenerative agriculture. All those people I would like to say in my peer group are now talking about nutrient density and the connection between soil health and human health and how food is grown. It's an exciting time to live in, and I'm uh, uh, glad to be a part of it. Steve, uh, before you joined us on the podcast today, uh, Eric and I were discussing how to how to uh, describe your title. Uh, we decided on farmer, author, and cover crop coach. Now, okay. I've never used that last one. <laughs> cover crop coach, is that a fitting title for you? Well, maybe you don't know this, Jeff, but I have a whole business called Cover Crop Coaching. Uh, that's actually an entity that I have formed uh, quite a few years ago, and, and that's what I use when I go speak and do my training events. So, uh, yeah, you're right on there, uh, and I, I appreciate it. I'm honored with uh, your designation there, what I do. So tell us how you use cover crops on your farm. Well, it uh, I could actually go back to my grandfather, who, uh, who my dad has told me, uh, you know, and I, I knew my grandfather, but he passed away when I was when I was young, that they actually did grow some cover crops in the 1950s. But then when chemicals came along and synthetic fertilizer, why bother with cover crops? You know, 
And uh, so there wasn't many used here in the farm until I later on saw that um, this could be advantage uh, to keep some soil eroding. And, and that has led to now pretty much since the mid nineties, I've done extensive research with the University of Maryland and Penn State University. I'm in cover crop C business for a while. I've literally done thousands of research trials involving cover crops here on this farm. And, you know, I asked the question back in the mid nineties, do cover crops pay? And in 1999, in some research we did here, we had a 28 bushel yield increase on our plots that had cover crops planted the previous four years. That was during a dry year. I haven't asked the question since, but people still ask that today. And I get it, I understand. But uh, I am committed to uh, making them work, maximizing their efficiency. And cover crops are key when we talk about this nutrient density and so forth for a lot of reasons that we might be able to get into then. And, and Steve, would be interested if you could just talk a little bit about the many benefits that you're seeing of cover crops economically, but but also um, otherwise, and kind of over what time scales? Cover crop, the name cover crop kind of indicates covering the soil, and that's how they got that name. Protecting it from soil erosion, particularly on steep slopes and so forth, that's where they kind of got their claim to fame. But now there's so much more. Uh, and, I, and I've learned so much over the years, and there's still a lot to learn. And I think the key thing right now is beyond just those fundamental things is understanding that having something living in the soil year round, be it our cash crop or our cover crop, is important to keep the biology alive and well. I think it's easy for people to understand, but it goes a step further. When we, when we understand how the mycorrhizae functions in the soil, that the mycorrhizae fungi is actually what takes nutrients out of the soil and helps get them into the plant roots. When we understand that, that's where we can start getting uh, a higher quality food product. And that also relates to another thing here is, is reducing or eliminating tillage. Uh, but cover crops are key in that, it keeps the soil covered, uh, it keeps life in the soil, diversity, all these things are important paramount, are important dynamics that, that function in, in a way that will let eventually lead to a better quality food product. And Steve, you mentioned a couple of things there, the idea of actually how the soil functions, and I know You've been at the forefront of uh, many innovations, the rolling roller crimper, the tillage radish, and yet, you know, now you're really trying to, you have a book out, uh, changing mindsets in a changing world. If you could speak to where's the role of these tools, but then also the importance of uh, an adaptable mindset. You know, tools uh, sometimes are created when there's a need, and that's what happened with the uh, with the rolling stalk chopper. So, uh, and, and rolling cover crops and crimping cover crops. I got the idea from the Brazilians from South America. Uh, I think it was the first one here in the United States to use it in the mid '90s. Developed the roller crimper. I still use it today. And um, and then the tillage radish uh, that came out of working with Dr. Ray Weil, University of Maryland. That's been used around the world. And you know, it used to be, it really kind of helped to be a spark plug for the cover crop movement. Now tillage radishes are used kind of, I say, as the salt and pepper of a cover crop mix. So uh, all these things have really revolutionized agriculture. And now to a point that, um, that we see they're, they're regularly used in the context of agriculture. Steve, here in the Shenandoah Valley, tillage radishes have become uh, more and more prevalent, but just a, a generation ago, it was a rare thing. Matter of fact, I remember the first time I heard the phrase tillage radish, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> now I laughed, but if you were standing in front of a classroom of kids, you know, FFA high school students, and they've never heard that phrase or how tillage radishes are used. Can you go over that with us? So Honestly, being a no-till farmer, uh, I had I struggled with that when that when that word was suggested by someone else, my partner in the business at the time. I didn't like the word tillage because I was kind of a no-till farmer. But then, as I thought about it, it took me one month to decide on that name uh, till I was comfortable with it. Actually, the radishes are doing the tillage, and the way that works is uh, these these white daikon type radishes are kind of like carrots, and they really are aggressive rooting down in. Their tuber grows 
and it opens up cracks in the soil or, or in, in, in the, the, the tap root really it does more work than tuber. A lot, a lot of people don't realize that. But the tap root can go down two, three, four, as we've seen it seven feet deep. So that's where that tillage comes in. We're doing natural tillage and uh, it doesn't disrupt anything because, you know, tillage with steel, that does nothing good for the soil health itself. I understand there's a need for it, but uh, that's where the term tillage radish came from. And, you know, it's kind of ironic looking back now. I questioned it for a month, but it was a stroke of genius because that now that term is used around the world. that you work a lot with University of Maryland and other universities on research and management. And so what have you seen over the years as the biggest um, change or transition or growth place in how we think about soil health management, cover crops or otherwise? Well, in the context of universities, and I'm going to include anybody that's influencing agriculture, USDA and so forth. In the mid 90s, when I've started becoming active in this space, it was strong headwinds um, with, with these organizations. They did not support what we were doing. Uh, and, and, and to their credit, and I'm gonna lump, this is very generally here, to, to, to today in 2022, most universities, uh, USDA and, and those who are involved in influencing farmers are seeing the, that soil health is, is the future. It's the way to go, it's become I'm not sure if I can say mainstream yet in the context of all of agriculture, but it's getting close. It's not a fad. It is a trend. And so, and a lot of times that just meant new blood. Um, so it's just human nature. Uh, and, and I love this young crop of eager, passionate people who are filling these positions. And what I really like to see is, you know, I used to be the one out there, you know, championing everything and I still am, but now I see other people who are actually covering the bases you know where I can't and so that's exciting for me to see people building in the foundation of what we worked for the last 20-30 years. And Steve I, I know some people think, say that sort of existing knowledge can be an obstacle and again you know how do you see soil health being centered with shifts in mindsets sometimes that can be somewhat of a leap for for some people. It is a big leap. And I, I always say that education is, is really paramount, but we got to back it up with some research. I think farmers themselves don't need a lot of research if they can kind of experience difference. And a lot of times they, they look at these things on ROI, return on investment. I caution farmers with soil health, you cannot look on an annual basis like we're used to doing with, with everything else in agriculture. You have to think about it as a 10-year plan. Can I make this work? What's my strategy for 10 years? Because I'll tell you, using cover crops in a certain year may not pay. There'll be other years where it'll pay for three years of whatever you're doing uh, in the cost and so forth. So you have to think bigger than one year. And I think that's important for people to understand if you're looking in to, to jump in this regenerative agricultural movement, that it's a long-term commitment. It took us a long time to get down here, uh, but it's gonna, and it, but we can, we, can, we can regenerate our soils relatively quickly with the information that we have out here in the context of availability of that nowadays. Steve, one final question from myself, and, and we hope that you'll stick around. We'll do a part two of this episode, but my final question for this one is uh, the popularity of cover crops in, in the mid-Atlantic region in Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, in that particular region, what is the most popular cover crop that you see in the field today? The most popular is still cereal rye because it's so versatile. It can be planted literally almost into December. You won't see it till March the 1st, maybe, but um, that's that's one reason why. Uh, so of course, seeing other, other kind of like, I'll call it in that grass type cover crops, triticale, even wheat um, and, and various other variants of that. Uh, of course, the radishes are still popular, legumes, hairy vetch, crimson clover, some of the more popular ones. But then you have some oddballs out there like Phacelia, fava beans, uh, peas, I should have mentioned in the legume group. 
uh, there's 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 some actually now some pretty good cover crops that have been bred or selected as cover crops. Uh, so it's just exciting to see that happen because when we started 25 years ago, we were kind of getting off the shelf stuff that wasn't really made for cover crops. It, it worked, but now fine tuning that is going to take this whole movement to the next level. Do cover crops work in backyard vegetable gardens? For instance, if I have a three or four raised beds and, uh, and I grow tomatoes and, you know, lettuce and bell peppers and that sort of thing, can I use cover crops? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, the easiest ones is, you know, now during the month of August or September to plant tillage radishes in your garden. If you want something really easy to do, mix a few oats with it if you want. Uh, that can help. It'll, it'll winter kill in most areas. That makes it easy. Then it gets a little more complex from there. But the answer is resounding yes. As I go through my home area here of Lancaster County and I look at the gardens, and I'll just say particularly the Amish uh, folks, Almost all of them are planting cover crops in their gardens now, and they all have radishes in it. Uh, they might mix it with oats, but I actually did a tally of dozens and dozens of gardens as I'm driving, and it's like 80% I could see radishes from the road in their little gardens by their house. So the answer is a resounding yes, Jeff. Well, we're going to continue this conversation in a part two, but I have to, we can't leave without plugging your new book. And then the title is? The title is The Future Proof Farm changing mindsets in a changing world. And it's how I see the future of agriculture, where it's going. It's based on my travels around the world. It's, uh, you know, more of a story type format. It is not specifically how to grow cover crops. It's, it's not, you know, that. It's more big picture. It'll inspire anybody uh, who eats. And I say that because, you know, farmers, it'll help inspire them to do this soil health thing. It inspires consumers to understand what farmers are doing out there to create and make nutritious food and how it is done. So uh, the, the book has been well received and it's kind of got me into a non-farm ag audience, uh, which, which I've quite enjoyed. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's doing well. And I, I was just glad I was able to take my thoughts from my mind and put them on paper and get them out there. Very good. The title of the new book, Future Proof Farmer, Changing Mindsets in a Changing World. Steve Groff, it's been a real pleasure to have you on, and we'll, we'll continue this conversation in the next episode. Mary and Eric, thank you also for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And that concludes this episode of For the Soil, a conversation. One quick reminder, and that is if you want to learn more about the four core principles of soil health, just visit our website at forthesoil.org. For the Soil, a conversation is made possible with funding support from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the Agua Fund. Other partners include the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Virginia State University, Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, and partners of the Virginia Soil Health Coalition. Views expressed on this podcast are those of each individual guest. To download a copy of this or any other episode, visit the website forthesoil.org. And if you have a specific question about soil health, contact your local Extension office, your local USDA service center, or a soil and water conservation district office. Music used during today's program was provided courtesy of Jackson F. Smith and Mr. Ruiz. All rights reserved. For the Soil, a conversation is produced by On the Farm Radio in collaboration with Virginia Tech. I'm your host, Jeff Ishing.